Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Kate Reeves and I'm with a nonprofit called Change Machine that builds financial security for low income communities through tech informed solutions. I'll be moderating this panel on the future of financial security as it relates to technology, equity, and the role of mission-driven organizations. Um, we wanna send a big thank you to NCRC for hosting this amazing conference and for the opportunity to present on this really important topic. Um, I'm honored to introduce some of my amazing colleagues on this panel um, who are going to shed some light on some of the current issues and challenges face facing mission-driven tech organizations, um, and specifically looking at the financial technology or the fintech field. So before we jump into what I'm hoping is a really robust discussion, um, I wanted to give my colleagues a chance to introduce themselves and uh, describe some of the work that they're, that they're doing. Um, so first, I'm really excited to introduce Jordan Sanchez, who's the Senior Partnership Lead at IDEO.org. So Jordan, I'll hand it to you. Thanks, Kate. Hi, everyone. Um, as Kate mentioned, I'm Jordan Sanchez, Senior Partnerships Lead at IDEO.org. Um, I look after our partnerships and projects focused on economic justice, two gen and whole family approaches and health and human services here in the States. Um, and so in my role, I work with uh philanthropy nonprofit partners um communities in the ground and government agencies to build better product services and programs uh through human centered design so uh i'll tell i'll talk a little bit about what audio.org is uh who we are and what we do so we're a social impact human centered design studio and organization um as such we focus on building products services and programs um in service of social equity so that's the work that we do we've been um around more, for around 10 years now so we're not that new uh, but excited to be a part of this work um and i'll give a little background on what human-centered design is um so uh, again we so for human-centered design is an approach to product and services and program design that focuses on desirability or the preferences of the users first so this sounds like it's um people are probably familiar with this but it's actually quite new especially social impact space. And so we're excited to be a part of this work. An um, important part for us is that uh, we believe that no product, no service, no program, no system that can be designed without the input and focus on the preferences of the people that will be using the services in the first place. So that's our approach to our work. Um, so as I mentioned, there are kind of three parts to product service and program design. It's first understanding desirability, what people want in the services that they interact with, uh, what technology, what things and infrastructure make it work, and what are the um, what are the systems behind the the those things that are designed? So the viability element, the values and the resources and the business elements of making those things work. We always start with the desirability, what, what people want, before we move forward to any other parts of the product design process. Um, at the heart of our work is community. Uh, co-design and co-creation. So we believe that we can't get to any meaningful solution without working with the people that are supposed to be using the service or the product in the first place. Um, and that's how we start every project, every program. Um, anytime that we build a partnership, it has to be centered on the desires, the preferences, um, the hopes and dreams of the people that we're working with. So um, it's a critical part for us. Uh, and it's a really important thing for us because it allows us to interrogate some of the um, the parts behind the design. So it lets us to interrogate the real preferences, the value systems, the things that are really driving the way people might use the services, the way that the systems that have to build these structures have to design. And so when we start with co-creation and co-design, we know that we can get to a meaningful solution if we go that way. Um, and so this is just uh, further saying, we started off thinking about desirability, feasibility, and viability. But we know that in service of social equity, we can think about equity, justice, systemic change, um, dismantling system of oppression through this work if we always start with community co-creation and co-design. So that's our work. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jordan. I'm really excited to, to jump further into it. Um, so next, I want to introduce Josh Sledge, who's the Senior Director of Incubation at Filing Research Institute. Um, so Josh, I will hand it to you. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Really appreciate the opportunity to be joining you today, as well as uh, to be a part of the, the NCRC conference. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm the Senior Director of Incubation at the Filing Research Institute. 
Uh, for those who aren't familiar with us, we are a 30 year old, uh, 30 plus year old think and do tank, we call ourselves, uh, with the mission of strengthening credit unions and their communities. Uh, so we have a membership of over 600 credit unions that we work with and try to provide them with the support and resources they need to think forward and change lives. So this includes connecting them with events and communities to share what they're learning, what their key challenges are. Um, we really, our bread and butter has been our, our research um, function where we have six centers of excellence. We partner with academic fellows to dig deep into some of those challenges and areas of interest for credit unions and their communities, things like uh, looking into emerging technology, understanding community social impact, uh, promoting DEI within the credit union industry, uh, things like that. Uh, we have our advisory services function where we get to roll up our sleeves and really do some custom research with our partners as well as uh, do some capacity building around their innovation and, and uh, ability to build new solutions. Uh, and last but certainly not least are our incubators where we are able to uh, test new solutions to some of these challenges we're talking about and share those with the field. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I can share a little bit more about that piece of the puzzle. It's um, where I'm, I'm really focused. Uh, the incubator is where Filene is able to, again, uh, seek, go through this process of seeking, testing, and scaling. We talk to our members to try to understand what their challenges are, what is really um, addressing their communities in terms of the way that they are uh, working and living and what's impacting their overall financial well-being. Look for some solutions that might be uh, um, uh, ways to, to address that. And then we're able to run live tests with our, our credit union members uh, and bring them in and put some of these solutions into the real world uh, and get some feedback around what's working, what's not, and then look to scale those solutions that are, are really showing promise. And so previously we've done this um, in a couple of examples. One was our Reaching Minority Households Incubator, uh, which we did in partnership with Visa, where we worked with credit unions who were developing strategies to try to reach black and brown communities. Uh, developed new products that were really meeting some of their needs, such as a, a lending product that was based on I-10 for new immigrants as opposed to social security numbers. Uh, and we were able to, again, test those out and see what worked, what didn't. That I-10 lending product in particular had some real traction, and we've been working since with a few partners to try to help scale that. Uh, we also had a uh, incubator around uh, fintech and really looking at which of the new fintech products and, and solutions could be a good fit for credit union members and really support uh, a holistic uh, set of products and solutions that were uh, that a credit union could offer uh, and so you know Filene has really been looking at that intersection between um how we serve communities uh, at, at, and at the same time use that as the basis of strategies um, for for credit unions really putting financial health of communities and members at the, at the core of what they do um, before my time at Filene, I was at the Financial Health Network, where I did a lot of similar work, uh, looking at potential partnerships between nonprofits and fintechs, seeing where there were opportunities, challenges, barriers to working together. Um, and in that uh, vein, got a chance to work with Change Machine and a few of the other uh, uh, real standouts when it comes to inter operating at that intersection of tech and equity. Uh, and just really excited to, to be here and a part of the conversation today. Awesome, Josh. Thanks. We're excited to, to have you on the panel. Cool. Um, so uh, the next panelist is um, Brian Cornish, who's the president of FinEquity. So I'll turn it over to you, Brian, and let me get your slides here. You Great. Yes, I'm here from FinEquity. We actually launched in early 2020 um, with a focus on building financial power um, by building bridges to financial power. And we do that specifically for community members who have been impacted by mass incarceration or directly experienced incarceration. Um, and what that looks like tends to focus on this idea of we want to create products that propel people along this pathway that they're already taking, which is the prison of prosperity journey. And in more detail, that can look like things such as removing barriers to services that should are, are harder to navigate, um, especially given if they've come home recently and what that looks like by giving access to capital when doors are closed. Um, specifically, again, because this person has been gone from the community for a really long time and making processes that are arduous, more simple and easy to deal with. Um, and so by, by the way we do that is to make sure that at the end of the day, we want to remix and restructure traditional financial services because we don't think it adequately meets their needs. And the ways we know that are because we, we really center lived experience and this idea of understanding um, what are the barriers people are experiencing um, even though we launched in 2020, most of our first year was 
kind of community research. We started off with conversations about what are people actually experiencing and what every time we solutionize, it's focused again by one of the expertise that we heavily lean on is this idea of lived experience. That's, that's the central expertise. And we then combine that with the financial expertise we have access to, the software development expertise we have access to, to then launch products. So I'll give an example of the product that we were able, um, well, I'll start with this, which is this idea of, <laughs> thank you, uh, which is this idea of um, we were really committed to one, using the co kind of design sessions that we had to think about what product did we wanna launch first? And our conversations early in 2020 had been with people who were stuck in the uh, in housing and security. So either they were in a shelter or they were um, living with family members. And the question was, well, what was the barrier for them from getting to their next um, level where they wanted to be? And um, of course, access to capital came up, but credit came up as an, a barrier too that extended their stay in an unstable housing situation. And so we created a product specifically to say, this is this is a tool that one, you're not going to be caught in a catch-22 where people tell you that they won't lend to you because you've never been lent to or you haven't recently been lent to. Um, and so our product kind of makes sure that that credit is available. So anyone who wants to establish credit or build credit can build credit through us at no cost and at no interest. Again, to meet this specific need of we don't want people staying in a shelter longer than they need to if the barrier is credit or capital. Um, and we hope to continue this work to kind of build tools that address specific needs that are surfaced through these community conversations. And I'm excited to, to kind of participate in this conversation. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks. We're, we're excited to have you and to talk more about Finequity and, and the work you're doing. So last but not least is my colleague Megan Bellotto, who's the Assistant Director of FinTech Partnerships at Change Machine. So thanks, Megan. I'll turn to you. Thank you. Hello. As Kate said, um, my name is Megan Bellotto. I'm the Assistant Director of FinTech Partnerships here at Change Machine. I have been with Change Machine since December of 2019, which feels like 100 years ago. Um, so, But I'm really excited to be a part of this panel of fantastic colleagues and experts. Uh, as Kate alluded to earlier, our mission here at Change Machine, uh, we build financial security for low-income communities through people-powered people technology. Our products and partnerships amplify the impact of social service organizations and public agencies and generate insights to help shape lasting change. And so our ultimate vision is to build an equitable economy in which we all thrive. So we can go to the next slide. Yeah, there we go. So recently, as, as part of uh, my work when I came on board to the team is um, to really center on fintech, inclusive fintech, safe fintech, to be able to connect practitioners, nonprofits, um, community-based organizations with uh, fintech uh, products and services that really help folks to achieve their financial goals and to build financial security over time. Uh, we call this the recommendation engine. We've built it into our existing tech platform and it really is a, a tool to empower uh, nonprofit practitioners directly to connect their customers with these uh, tools and services that might you know, help them to, to achieve goals, to um, build their financial security, be that credit, be it saving for school, be it um, you know, trying to budget uh, monthly for groceries. So it's been really exciting. We've been uh, partnering with um, mission-driven and like-minded fintechs around the country pretty aggressively, including uh, Brianne with FinEquity. We're really excited to have them come on board as a partner um, and continue to build this and learn about what types of products and services are gonna be most useful for folks and uh, where the gaps are so that we can start to build uh, more of a movement to, um, to to support fintechs creating and designing products that really meet the needs of low income and especially black and brown individuals around the country. So the way that we uh, evaluate our fintechs that we partner with uh, is through uh, what we're calling our seal of inclusivity. And so there's four major pillars uh, that we're looking for when we look for a partner in a fintech. The first is that it has that product has to build financial security and it has to be able to prove that somehow. Um, it also has to be fairly priced. So we very, very much firmly believe that because the customer is at the center and that 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 desire, that person is the person who makes the choice, um, there's no real sort of threshold of what is too expensive or not or, or too uh, free. It's really about um, the value that the customer receives from engaging with a particular fintech product. So we're calling it fairly priced. 
inclusive and accessible, we're really looking for fintechs that, again, are designed with the needs of the communities um, that they're trying to serve. So be that uh, differences in you know, apps or products that are in different languages um, or that allow for ITIN. Um, so we're looking for all of those types of features. And then finally, safe and transparent. We wanna make sure all of these fintech um, products and services are really clear about their, about their goals and that they're able to safely protect uh, the goals and integrity and data and um, financial security of the, their customers. Finally, after we have a whoop, go one more back, I'm just going to talk real quick about the seal of equity things. Um, the, uh, so once a product is in the platform, based on all of the uh, research that we've done on our side, then we have a second piece, which is the seal of equity. So we really, again, want to make sure that the products that we have that we're sharing meet the needs of the folks that we're trying to get them into the hands of. And so we have opportunities for practitioners and customers alike to, uh, to share back what they think about products. This might be a great product, but I wish it was in Spanish, or this is a great product, but you're not available in Florida and I really want you to come here. So these types of things really help to build um, our knowledge and the knowledge of FinTechs about what is gonna be most useful for, um, for folks around the country. And so part of our work is that we wanna make sure that we are highlighting uh, FinTech founders that are black and brown uh, or women as well. And so we're committed to at least 40%. Right now we're actually around 60%, but at least 40% of the products featured in the recommendation engine are founded by BIPOC uh, leaders or women and sometimes both. So we all know that um, the FinTechs uh, that are developed uh, by these folks, by black and brown individuals and women are going to be more effective in design and reach and building the financial security of communities of color and women and marginalized folks. So that is that is absolutely a, one of our more exciting features of the recommendation engine work. Awesome, great. I'm super grateful to all the panelists again and excited to kind of like jump into the to the conversation. So I'm actually gonna stop sharing my screen so that I can see everybody in, in bigger bigger fashion. So, um, and, and really just like jump right into the discussion um, and spend maybe the last like sort of 20 minutes of this really talking about all of the ways in which, um, what does this future look like with FinTech? So I wanna kind of start the discussion with all of you by kind of talking about where, where we're at in the FinTech industry so so last year and and in 2019 also it was there was a huge amount of money that went into the fintech industry um an unprecedented amount of money uh and the industry still is struggling to meet some of the needs of you know about a third of americans low-income individuals who are who are really struggling to get access to financial services and that low-income people uh, adopt fintech at a much lower rate than their wealthier counterparts. Um, and so my first question really for the panelist, panelists, and, and this is really for all of you, are what are some of the factors that you see in your work that really create barriers for, for, for fintech adoption, specifically as it relates to low-income communities? Um, and what are, what are some of the impacts of that, that lack of adoption? I don't know who wants to jump in first. I'll jump in. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Brian. Um, so one one barrier. So I, I think we're starting to see a lot of movement on this, especially because of of COVID. But I think for fintech organizations, if they're connected to traditional banking systems, um, then it's then it's contingent on the user also usually mostly also having to have some traditional banking system. And I think, I hope we're seeing this with the FinTech, but I hope it attaches to the entire financial industry that we start to see people designing systems that incorporate people who are not using traditional banking systems. Um, I would say the significant number of cl clients that we have that use Chime is, is, is high, especially, it probably increased significantly, but it's very high. Um, and so if we have FinTech providers or partners who cannot operate with a Chime bank account, it does decrease what other financial services that they'd be willing to adopt, given that they're trusting us to say, hey, this might be a good partner. So they're open to it. But if it can't work with their system and how they come to this space, then it's not going to go anywhere further. 
So that's one of the kind of biggest factors that I can see is that we need to really start to think more about the breadth of banking um, and even start to get more aggressive um, as we start to think about what unbanked means. And I'll just make one last point on this, which is that sometimes people, I don't even think that unbanked exists. I think that people who are unbanked from our experience have been people who bank through their family members, right? So they don't have access to traditional systems, but they pay bills, they do things, they figure it out using different payment systems. And so this idea of kind of thinking through that as well, where we have to kind of understand that people are on a spectrum and how do we create for that entire spectrum? I'll jump in with just a bill there, Brian. I think, yeah, in our work, I think we're encountering similar um, kind of ideas that uh, as people engage with some of these products, there isn't a, a full end-to-end -end flow. It doesn't connect to the way that they enter in using the service. And so oftentimes it becomes a challenge to even complete simple tasks. And I think to, to your point, it's because of the base system that it might be connected to. And so that's the first thing we've learned that on a few, a few of our projects, some of the work that we do. I think on the piece around adoption or just usage, um, specificity, specificity of context isn't taken into account oftentimes with the design of products. So, um, and if it doesn't align with kind of the, the process or the value systems of the individual user, it just won't be something that's attractive to you. So I think Brian, your, your, um, your design choices around working with just as involved people and that process and the timeframes that they have to do, the very specific nuance in the way that the product and the services are designed, um, doesn't come across often in the field. I think um, that's one thing that we're encountering quite a bit. Um, and in behind it for us, uh, we found that oftentimes uh, financial services are very individually focused. Um, and what we're coming to find is that oftentimes people are looking for products that are um, whole family, intergenerational focused. How does this get from one step to another? And oftentimes uh, products aren't designed that way. So from an adoption perspective, designing for those things would be really important. Yeah, I'll, I'll add, I mean, I think, you know, Brian and, and Jordan hit on some really uh, key points. Uh, you know, in, in previous uh, initiatives or pilots, you know, things around just basic ID requirements that, you know, sometimes can be a hiccup as well as I think Megan mentioned, language oftentimes can be a huge one. Um, just, you know, even Spanish, there's a, a, a huge percentage of fintech uh, products just aren't translated or really designed to operate in Spanish. And so, um, you know, it kind of represents some of those barriers. And then I think there's just something around basic marketing, right? Who, who are the products being developed and designed for, to Jordan's point? I mean, I think in some ways it echoes what you see in the broader financial services industry. You know, a lot of the um, uh, development is in places around lending or it's in um, investment management or wealth management. And, and those products are going to be built for and more accessible to people um, who have more money um, or, or uh, have a, a more established credit score. And unfortunately, we know that, you know, when you're looking at LMI and communities of colors, or communities of color, that's where you are, are going to see um, uh, folks, you know, don't have those assets or, or um, lack the, the access to, to, to capital and, and credit in those more traditional forms. So I think part of it is just, you know, is there the focus on, on really designing for those specific needs and, and really creating products that speak to them specifically? Uh, in some instances, yes, but when you look at the full scope of the fintech landscape, it's still a relatively small part of the puzzle. Just one quick point, Kate. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree with what you're saying, Josh. I think that's, and, and everybody, I agree with everyone, what everyone said, but to build on that a little bit, I think that um, what we're seeing as in the research that we're doing is that there is a lack of sort of onboarding type products and a lack of products that sort of meet somebody where they are in a specific place for a specific need, but then help them to transition to the next stage and the next step and what that might look like. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of the fintechs that we come across are sort of like my colleagues like to call it like the Cadillacs of fintechs where there's all of these different like features and they're so cool. But um, maybe that person really just in that moment needs a very specific thing and all of these extra features while they're nice can be really overwhelming and also to your point about the language piece which we're running into a lot and i've been doing some research on this. Because there's a lot of concern out there that part of the lack of adoption is coming from mistrust. And there certainly is a, a whole element of that uh, that goes long back into like structural racism and you know everybody's feelings about um, formal financial institutions, which is absolutely valid. But on another point of it, 
a lot of the, uh, even if a FinTech is translated into a different language, a lot of times the actual sort of legal terms and conditions, data privacy stuff is not translated. And so if you're, if you have any questions or concerns about that, that's immediately going to, going to bring about like, you know, like, I don't, I don't know if I can trust them or not. So yeah, there's a lot in the design that, um, in the marketing that I think uh, could, could really lead to some good changes. So. Yeah, I think that's all, they're all great points. And, you know, have, I have like maybe like a kind of a two part question, like sort of what do you, what does this group sort of um, think the impacts are of some of those design challenges? Like what are sort of the, the ways in which that's, you know, these, these sort of uh, the products that are not designed for low income communities is really manifesting itself in, you know, real, real impact in low income communities. So I'll jump on. Oh, go ahead, Josh. Sure. Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, I'm gonna think about that question around impact. I think about kind of the range of fintech quality, right? There are good products that are really helping people to save money, to build their credit, to um, you know, access new income opportunities. And you know, I saw just on the the, the list of companies on the, the change machine platform, you know, folks like Fresh EBT and Saver Life are designing specifically for LMI households and are able to show that they're making a meaningful improvement. In their financial health. So I think in some ways, you know, it's if similar products aren't being designed so people can access them, right? Then there's a problem because people aren't getting the upside of fintech. Uh, and on the other side of the spectrum, when you look at some of the products that may be harmful, too often they're either being targeted towards communities of color um, and LMI populations or impacting them um, in a disparate fashion. So, you know, for instance, we've seen reports and, and analysis showing that some of the um, alternative underwriting and AI platforms, tools that are used to underwrite loans, they're exciting about credit access, but we've seen that some of them may be uh, charging uh, people of color higher interest rates than others or giving adverse lending decisions in ways that weren't intended. Uh, but as the algorithm started to, to run, uh, they kind of, you know, we hear this term virtual redlining and kind of put together these systems of biases. So in those instances, um, you know, having access to those types of products or, or going to them can be actually harmful. So I think this is really where the challenge is, particularly for a lot of folks who are working to support communities is um, how do you parse it out, right? So that you're, you're able to get the benefits and direct people towards that and, and make, get the positive impact, uh, but, but really be able to influence the industry in a way that, um, and, and protect um, uh, consumers in ways that, uh, you know, kind of keep them away from the bed. Brian, did you want to add? I just want to jump in really quick about a marketing point. I think it's kind of related to Josh's point, but this idea of, um, we don't have a really good vehicle for marketing. And I think that what happens is that the well, most well-resourced organizations, let's say the venture-backed organizations that might be FinTech are able to then get on TV. And that will be the choice that people will see. Sometimes that's what I, I that's what I hear. And that doesn't, that, that impacts um, in a negative way because then that, that's not a lot of options, right? It's just the one that was able to get on TV. So I'll say, I'll go with that one. Not necessarily because it offers the best benefit to me or is even the cheapest. There's actually maybe a free resource that I didn't even know about, but this one is the one that I saw on TV. Um, and I think that, that that's the way it can impact people by giving them less options and not the full spectrum of things that they can decide from and kind of uh, pick the one that's actually better for them. Yeah, I'll build on that. I think it's the, the impact is uh, that lack of choice often. And um, to Megan, to your point about being able to make decisions around what um, what products are equitable, which ones speak to my values, which which ones will help me reach the outcomes that I expect to reach often aren't provided for, for the same for the same structural reasons, not having visibility, not being marketed around. Um, and then Josh, your point about that spectrum people are always having to stay in that space where they're choosing extractive products um, instead of ones that would be perpetuating kind of the compound interest, if you will, of making the right interest, making the choices that are specific to their to their, um, to their their context. So that's, what we're seeing the same, same thing. I feel like it's a really good lead into sort of like what the future could look like. Like what is our, what is the role of a practitioner? What are the role of FinTechs in the future? I mean, and Josh had started talking about this, but there are so many upsides to fintech, um, especially for low income communities. It provides an opportunity for cheaper prices, more options, especially in the, the context of COVID-19 and the pandemic. It's 
becoming more accessible and more important to have sort of these virtual like virtual services online services um and so i think because we are at a conference about an inclusive economy um i am really curious and maybe this is really a, com a a sort of a question for Megan and Jordan around what the role, what role can nonprofit practitioners play in holding fintech accountable um, to promote the financial security of low income Americans and those who've been historically pushed to the margins of our economic system. I could jump in. I think, again, uh, just leaning more kind of into the values discussion, we talk about this a lot and back to the, the issue of choices is that oftentimes in financial services is an either or choice. There's this, you can do this or you can't, or you can reach your goal or you won't um, in the constraints of the system that we have now. And I think the role that nonprofits can play is bringing um, like, what if, what is that third option? What is that new way of, of interacting with these systems to help us reach our goals the way that we'd expect for ourselves and for our community and for our next generation? And I think interestingly, that we get to be imaginative in this space to think about what is the new version of the thing that we hope to exist in the future. Um, that oftentimes the kind of the formal system or the, the private sector system might be are constrained by policy regulation and some of the forces around marketing and, and accessibility. And so I think we actually have a really interesting place to play and just a, like what could a new thing look like that doesn't exist before as a as a field. And so bringing that kind of thought to to this work um, is a mandate that we you know we hold and we can carry. So that's more values. Not very specific, but I think we have that option. That option. No, I like it. I, I that was inspiring. Thank you. I feel I feel mandated and inspired. Um, I also think that that nonprofits and and the practitioners that make them up, sort of. I mean, we're all in a place where, uh, like, the cat's out of the bag. Like, it's happening. FinTech is happening, um, and it's going very fast. And um, what we do know, particularly for communities that have been historically pushed to the margins, treated poorly by all of this, the institutions in this country, is that for them, a trusted resource is a really important thing. And so nonprofits in many, and community-based organizations in many ways are kind of that trusted resource, that place where a person can go and really feel confident that the person that they're asking advice from or, you know, learning from is giving them you know appropriate information safe information and so nonprofits and practitioners and nonprofits actually have a really unique space to sort of support the communities in which they work by saying okay this is happening here are some tools that you can use to identify whether a product is going to be the right fit for you here is a list of products that we've already researched that we think are going to be great that we've partnered with we've talked to them we know that we know other people who have used them who have had positive financial security outcomes or have reached whatever their goals might be. And kind of like, it's so it, there's a, a little bit going back to the mandate thing, a little bit of a mandate for nonprofits to sort of like take a deep breath and recognize that it's all gonna be a lot of work, but as much as um, our the communities that we serve have to build their capacity to sort of like think about FinTech differently and think about what the opportunities as well as the risks are, the nonprofits also have that mandate to sort of sit with themselves and say, okay, what are some of the what are some of the learnings that we can do and what are the ways that we can support um, delivery of some of these fantastic fintechs that do exist that are out there that can actually um, really help. Yeah, I think that's that that's great. I mean, I think there's also just a role of you know nonprofits and the the customers that they're working with are they have a, a huge voice in this that's a huge sort of like for lack of a better word voting block within the fintech industry and using and amplifying those those voices i think is really important in the context of of that so it's definitely definitely important and there's a role for for nonprofits to play in this um I, maybe kind of looking at the other side for Josh and Brian, what, how can financial institutions and fintechs also play a role in holding the new fintech um, industry sort of accountable for, for making sure that we have safe and inclusive products? Brian, do you want to go first? Um, okay. Um, thank you. Okay. So I think it's related to kind of, well, one thing I'll say about, you know, what, what I really like about change machine is this idea of being very clear about um, what products can add value to, you know, what are the re restraints? Cause I think every product does have constraints 
And um, I like to, I, I thought I would say it was transparency, but it's way more than transparency because transparency is this idea of telling people what the APR rate is. Um, that's not <laughs> like it's a level of transparency, but it's not deep enough. It, 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 it's, it's not engaging. It kind of ends the conversation. It doesn't invite and say, well, let's actually get to know what this means for you on an individual basis based on what, you know, what you're planning to do. Um, and just like the idea of language being very transparent. So I, I think the role fintechs, uh, fintechs and financial institutions can play is one living those values, which is going way past transparency. What does that mean about your own services, about the restraints that you do have, not withholding that information, being very transparent about that information. Um, and this idea of uh, letting people know that there are up options. So this idea of just putting that on the table as well, which is, you know, we may charge this, other people may charge this. It's not to say that this is the only place you can get this resource, um, because I think that does um, create this negative environment where people feel like, okay, I gotta go for this because this is the only option on the table. It's not. Um, and I think we can live through those values um, by talking about them. I wanna say thought leadership, which is a, is a term that I came across in the past decade. Uh, this idea of talking about it, talking about those values and getting people to kind of you know buy into them, but also also operating under them. Yeah, and I'll say from the financial institution perspective, I think there's a, a couple of, of different ways to think about it. I mean, the first is oftentimes financial institutions are partnering with fintechs, right? They're either providing the back end umph. Um, you know, Chime is probably sitting on top of a, another bank that's you know providing the back end plumbing and, and compliance work. Uh, or they're, you know, referring a, a product to their their members or their or customers. I think in those instances, there's a big opportunity as a customer partner uh, to make sure that the fintechs you're partnering with are providing safe products that are ultimately, especially if they're getting in the hands of your customer, um, are going to be safe and making sure you're looking out for their their best interest above and beyond what's required from just a compliance standpoint, right? I mean, that's that's table stakes. What else can you really do um, when you're vetting new partners to say, um, are you really going to be good for uh, the the members or, or customers we're serving? I and the second thing I say is compete, right? Compete for 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 LMI communities business um, on the basis of improving their financial well being and their financial health. I think if, if you are a bank or a credit union and, and you are reaching into communities, trying to understand their needs, building uh, good products at good prices and providing value and thinking about how you can support the community, that's going to hold fintechs accountable because then they have to compete um, with, with you as well. So I think the more good products you have, the more it puts pressure on, on other good products to come about. So I think that's another way for financial institutions to, uh, to, to really lean on that industry to, to, to step up. Can I just add one more thing? Awesome. Um, thank you. I think that in addition to to what you just shared, what you both just shared, I also think that you know, in my conversations with with many financial institutions and fintechs over the past year and a half or so, there's often sort of maybe a hesitancy to actually go into the communities that they're trying to serve and really do some hard like focus group work, um, you know, and product testing from the, you know, from the perspective of the fintech or the financial institution. And so not just sort of making assumptions based on like large data swaths about what is going to be useful and what's going to be helpful for folks, but actually spending time in the communities and saying like, what, how can we make this better? How can we make this work better for you? And normalizing that a little bit and taking that feedback and actually incorporating it as opposed to saying, well, you know, know your customer role says it's too hard. So that's just how it's gonna be. But really like starting to spend some time like thinking more explicitly and bringing the community into that as opposed to we hear that, you know, this is your problem. So we've created this for you. You're welcome, kind of a, kind of a mentality. I also add one build. Um, this is hearkening back to my days in financial institutions working in banking, but this idea of like what does what is really our fiduciary responsibility? So the idea of uh, there's compliance, there's rules in place, compli uh, regular compliance and transparency or table stakes. But like what are the downstream what are the downstream things that institutions, services, products can look forward to, uh, for for clients and bring that back to them in the service and product design really resonated with what you all have been sharing. So just a personal reflection, that was really important to me. Awesome. I feel like this is 
a really inspiring place to sort of like leave the panel and and transition to the, the question and answer section. So I really want to thank all our panelists and NCRC um, for for hosting and for being part of this conversation. Um, and I really encourage you to learn more about all of our panelists work, uh, either by visiting their websites or um, really participating in, in the conference a little bit more. So Thank you for, for uh, discussing this with us for the last 45 minutes or so. Hi everyone, um, thanks for joining us. We're, we're really excited to continue the conversation. So, Please uh, feel free to drop questions as they come up in the chat. Um, I'm trying to see if there's any yet. I think maybe to start us out, because I don't see any, unless I'm missing it, but in um, questions from the audience yet. But there is a question that I that I had that we didn't quite get to in the panel um, that I would love to, to do sort of just a, a quick warm up round Robin with, our, with the panelists. And so, one of the things that we had talked a lot about are, is sort of the role of fintech and nonprofits in, in the context of, of changing uh, the landscape. But wanting to kind of hear from all of you what, what resources and um, the environment, but it could be the environment or other resources do nonprofits and fintechs need to really make this change happen? So maybe we can start, start there. It doesn't have to be a round round, but anyone who wants to jump in. So, uh, Kate, can I could just ask you to maybe rephrase the question? Sorry, Jordan, I didn't mean to jump in front of you if you were going to say anything. Um, can I just ask you to maybe clarify the question you're asking? So, like, where are the resources for fintechs to, for nonprofits to learn more about? The Sorry, piece. to to make a, the new future of fintech that we sort of laid out, what resources do we need? Interesting. Okay. Jordan, did you have a thought? Well, I, I actually, just based on a lot of the work that we've done with you at Change Machine, Kate, but thinking about, I mean, really thinking about um, kind of the back end technological infrastructure and oftentimes um, for nonprofit or a social impact organization, oftentimes are working on the front end without a deep immersion in the back end of what some of the fintechs is. So integration, integrated systems, data systems, like some of these things that are kind of, um, might have might already be established that would help superpower some of the changes that are happening in the, in the social impact space. So I think that's one like area that's right for partnership. And I know you all are doing a lot of this already, but I think that continued kind of immersion in the in the uh, techno technological infrastructure that would be required in the back in the back for this work is something that um, I think nonprofits can really dig into to make impact. Yeah, and I think a bigger picture on that infrastructure point, I think there's just something around, you know, making sure everyone has access to uh, affordable, high quality Wi-Fi, right? I mean, just, uh, you know, a lot of people were seeing some of the, the, the access to, to Wi-Fi, especially for people that are able to use smartphones, it's, it's increasing, but the digital divide is still there, it still exists. And uh, even if you have access one day, is that reliable access? You know, if you're using a product to save over a year, you need to have that same phone and that same phone number um, for a year. So, um, you know, what are just the, the the broader infrastructure resources just to enable that people have access to the kinds of devices and, and um, uh, uh, internet access they need to, to really take full, uh, full uh, advantage of some of these new tools? I would just add two. Um, one would be this idea of um, one is like resources for community engagement because I think that's such a important part of the product, like developing products. Um, when I think about the idea that there are people who are accessing it, the internet via their mobile phone, or that there are still many people who have phones that do not have access to, cannot see, go to the internet. And the full spectrum of like, there's so many products that if we actually were to this idea that yes, people want to keep that phone, there's some value that they want to have with that phone, or there's a, a, you know, there's a lot of people who are still in that situation. What does it look like to still create products for them in that situation? We know that maybe it'll change soon because maybe they'll 
you know, through a family, they'll find out this is a better phone or they'll see the value of the smartphone and not be intimidated by it because it can be really intimidating. Um, then they'll get access to new products. But for where they are right now, um, I think a, a lot of organizations do need resources to invest in this I idea of community engagement as part of their product development process. And um, on the flip side of that, I'd say uh, in, in addition to data, back end, um, trying to, the, the regulatory part of it as well, just because um, there are a lot of ways to create financial solutions. And I think if you've been in the financial industry for a long time, you have, you're privy to all of that. You're privy to how to set up a credit line. You're privy to just particular things that um, a lot of fintechs will have to figure their way out to, through, um, even though it's been figured out before. So I think um, that sharing of that knowledge can, can help us you know, e erect solutions faster um, that that are based on this idea that maybe we've heard from the community that this is something that should exist. Now we have to figure out and get qu quickly be able to implement it. That's awesome. Thank you. We have a few questions that are coming through in the chat. Um, one is around how do you identify your nonprofit partners? So I think that's probably likely for maybe more like Jordan and Megan. I'll let you go ahead, Megan, this time. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, so at Change Machine, we're always looking for uh, nonprofit partners that are really trying to build financial security, obviously through financial coaching programs, financial capability programs, um, but also any organization that is working to build sort of the, the the agency and the ability like break down barriers so that folks can actually survive in the moment, but then also thrive and build all of that. So that could look like a workforce development organization. It could look like a domestic violence organization. It could look, you know, like a sort of a larger standard um, nonprofit in service delivery. So we're just look really looking for folks that are, um, trying to not just address symptoms, but um, really start to tackle problems at the root cause. Um, and so we're always open for, for new folks that are excited about that. Yeah, I think we actually take quite a similar approach. Um, we recognize that most of the challenges that we try to design around are intersectional. So it requires that you have to think um, kind of uh, like from an ecosystem lens for a family or a person of the change you'd hope to seek. And so we look for film, uh, partners that think that way too. Um, that also, I think, are interested in, uh, Brianne, your point about uh, community engagement, user engagement first as um, the impetus for any change or any solution that's supposed to happen. And so we spend a lot of time discussing those things with our partners or whomever works with us on our projects to make sure that we're aligned in those ways um, and I think for that, it helps us um, better get through the design process so we can actually get to a solution that's meaningful. Um, and the other piece is just like staying committed to the entirety of the design process. It takes a while to get from understanding the user to designing a new version or new product or cutting away maybe some things that are at barriers. And so we look for um, kind of those commitments too from our partners. That's great. There's a there's a few more that I think are both really great questions. So I'll start with um, Patrick's question here. How do you see um, LMI fintech services, especially virtual banking products, subverting payday lenders and cash uh, checking services in a way that many maybe credit unions specifically for LMI folks um, seek to do? So how how has the fintech industry really changed some of these more predatory products? Yeah, I think in a, in a, few, a couple of ways, there's, uh, you know, we've seen fintech providers work with, I think, some of those same players that Patrick mentioned, uh, credit unions and CDFIs to provide them with platforms or tools that they can then offer their members and customers that I think have been successful. Um, you know, as he mentions payday lenders, I'm thinking about a company called QCash. It's um, uh, uh, was formed out, in, out of a credit union in the state of Washington. Uh, but it was basically developed for credit unions to be able to offer a payday lending product quickly, right? We all know that one of the main um, points of competition when it comes to why are people going to credit or payday lenders is speed, right? I need the money now. I, I can't wait three days or go through a financial education class or whatever, um, you know, this alternative may be able to have. So the QCash platform 
think within the six or seven taps can get people uh, approved through the process and money into their accounts. And so these are our products that are being delivered by credit unions, meaning that they are at much lower interest rates by law. Um, but oftentimes those credit unions as well are offering other types of savings products, other types of supports. Um, so in that instance, you're seeing how that use of technology enables a credit union to be able, who has a payday alternative product, to be able to compete with that payday lender on the basis of speed, right? Merely meeting that, that consumer's need. So I think there, there's a lot of those types of partnerships, um, as well as I point to um, the, the group in the InLift group, right? And I know the change machines involved. A lot of nonprofits were developing their own uh, financial technology. You know, Saver Life just hit the... Um, I think the 500,000 member mark, 500,000 people have used that platform. It's a savings platform designed specifically for uh, low and moderate income uh, folks. And it, it has a real track record of helping them save money. And, and especially during the pandemic, they've been able to use the platform as ways to provide support um, for people that are going through emergencies and, and, and be able to crunch the data to really get insight on some of those needs of the communities at the time. So I think there's ways that the technology itself can be applied. Uh, to really be, uh, um, you know, kind of attacking some of those um, uh, harmful products and, and really trying to compete out of them. Uh, there's another question around, are there the companies that sit behind them, right? It's the, the companies that are behind them. Um, you know, what are they, what's their, their main motivation for coming to the marketplace and really how are they approaching um, uh, the use of te that technology? Yeah, I'd also like to follow up quickly on that. Um, we have also partnered with another uh, sort of their backing credit union is U.S. Alliance, but Dora is a um, is an online only uh, bank that is super easy to and for eligibility reasons and like sign up process is really easy to get into. And then once somebody has that checking account, which is completely free, um, it is available for ITIN holders and Social Security hold number holders. Then as they're using that product, which allows them to to deposit checks remotely to like not spend money cashing checks and things like that, then they have available to those folks, um, those customers, um, the other U.S. Alliance products that they have, which is a wide range of products that maybe that person would not have been eligible for first. So what I'm seeing actually a lot of in terms of the from the banking perspective a lot of fintechs thinking really, and, and credit unions and CDFIs, thinking really carefully about, as I mentioned earlier, those onboarding products. So getting somebody kind of in the door with their basic needs and then helping them like through the process. It's not always not always quick to your point, Josh, but helping them to the process to then graduate into, um, you know, different types of products that, they, that they're then available to them. I'll just add a point there, which is that um, I kind of see a mix because during the pandemic in that, my neighborhood, I still saw tons of people waiting outside of a cash cash checking place. Um, and I still saw some many people also banking directly with the bank. So not using like a mobile tool, but long lines outside of the bank, down the street, long lines outside of the ca cash checking place. And so I think it's about, um, again, similar to what Megan said, this idea of giving people a tool that they can use, but also making sure that they are onboarded properly to be able to see the full utility that might then, you know, mean that the next time they make a choice about going to their local cash checking place, which is right, you know, five blocks down, maybe there's a reason why they decide, well, that's, you know, this actually is easier. This choice to go with this LMI FinTech service is easier for me. Um, and I think those those kind of decisions are what we want to see more of. But I'm I'm kind of still seeing like a mix. I, I feel like there are people who, nevertheless, are, are using still a mixture of both until they get good reasons to start using these fintech services more. Yeah, I think that's a really it's a really great a great point, and I think that is is definitely something that we were talking about at Change Machine is sort of that value exchange and kind of thinking about how fintechs can add value and what we had talked about through the panel. How do you really reach communities in a in a meaningful way too? So I, I really like that. I think I really kind of want to end with this question because I think it's a really good one. Um, and I'll change it a little bit so that, Brian, if you have any success stories also, but do you have any success stories about a particular product or service and how it's pov positively impact LMI communities um, or those who are usually facing barriers to accessing financial services? And so, Brian, I wanna also make sure that you get an opportunity to talk about any success stories too from, from your own, um, from FinEquity's perspective. 
want to open that up to the panel also. So for, for us, um, we're, we do credit building. So credit building is one of those tools that takes a little bit of a more of time. So credit building takes time. <laughs> um, and, and so the media impacts aren't, aren't necessarily seen, but um, just getting people their credit status, I, I think is really important. Um, for us, we serve people who are coming home. Um, we, when we talk to financial players, they talk about issues of credit invisibility and um, there's like a lot of research on it, but in, in real time, there are people that we work with who can't get access to their social security benefits because they are credit invisible. Um, and so that's because, you know, as the social security benefits are, are using I identity like checks, security questions from their credit report, but they don't have one. Um, and so in, in real time, I think those success stories that people are actually on in on for their individual scenarios being blocked by, um, blocked to benefits such as like social security, even the affordable care act actually is in the same boat. Um, and so what, for us, what it means when we, when we say we're building someone's credit or for any kind of credit builder loan that's out there. So not just ours, but the other ones as well, by establishing somebody's credit history, they are getting access to a, a number of services that were then either not available to them. And maybe they didn't understand why for the person that I mentioned with the social security benefits, they didn't understand that it was related to their credit at all. Um, and so I think there are, are real tangible effects, especially around credit because we overuse credit. And that's really the problem. Credit builder loans are only of value because we've had this overuse of the system. So I think there are many success stories, but it all stems around what barriers have we already created as a financial system? And then these products are coming in to kind of deconstruct some of that. That's awesome. Thank, thank you, Brian. I don't know if any of the other panelists have a success story or ways in which they've seen positive impacts in LMI communities specifically for, for either specific products or um, through a specific design mechanism. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I think, you know, one thing uh, I've seen, you know, previously uh, uh, was at the Financial Health Network and was working on a program called the Nonprofit FinTech Exchange, which was really looking at partnerships between community organizations and fintech providers where products were either developed in partnership or delivered to as a part of broader programs. And we saw a lot of success there. So uh, the National Urban League was, you know, in, in a lot of the work they were doing directly with um, uh, financial coaching and coaching some of their clients, able to introduce products that met the particular needs without having any kind of back end arrangement, just kind of saying here, this could work, this might work well for you and saw some uh, good results there with people being able to select products that help them save or, or pay down their debt. Uh, we saw Greenpath, which is uh, one of the nation's largest credit counselors and in, in, uh, working with uh, an organization called EarnUp to create a, a program so that when people who weren't necessarily qualifying for a debt management repayment plan could still get a, a tool that helped them pay down their debt faster, help them manage it, pay it down in a way that was, was optimal for them. And again, saw people saving a, a, a significant amount of money in terms of uh, reducing their debt, reducing the amount of total interest they pay over time. Um, and so I think there's a lot of uh, those kind of partnerships, essentially, especially where the, the voice of the, the nonprofit and community organization is influencing how the product is either developed um, and designed or how it's delivered. And it, so it's really um, um, designed to meet the needs of, of the people they're serving. I think that's a, a good recipe for, um, for, for finding some success. Yeah, and I think for us, um, we often work through partnerships. So we're not an implementer per se ourselves, but we work with implementers through our work. Um, I think we see success kind of in two ways. Um, the first is when you're shifting the discussion around the conditions to make people successful is the first, I think probably what we see the most, uh, like most useful for success and impact. Um, and so an example of that is we developed a toolkit. Um, and so, and also trying to make sure that we make our products are designed to be like simple, accessible and replicable for people. So developed a, a toolkit for um, Latino families in California around financial health and security. The purpose was twofold to, to start engaging individuals to understanding uh, financial health, uh, health and wellness and financial security, but also to start engaging um, like local leaders, some of the policymakers, some of the folks in the area to start thinking the same way around um, financial security for that community. And so um, we find that like it was a really simple design deeply steeped in community um, engagement 
but it started fostering um, like meaningful discussions around changes in policy regulation um, and people's um, kind of power when it comes to statutory change in their area. And that was a really um, something that we lean on a lot in our work. And then from a technical perspective, um, this is more, um, this was in, in, not in the States, but we developed a program called Bcash, which was a first of its kind digital platform for um, small, um, small businesses to connect to a digital cash transfer from their client to themselves. So uh, really focused on supporting um, women entrepreneurs. And we saw um, because of its kind of a simple application, Brian, to your point about it being um, in a tool that everyone has access to, which is a smartphone, um, we're able to start facilitating um, like rapid cash transfers from individuals to these entrepreneurs. And so uh, be, for us, we find that really successful because it, again, it was simple design, meeting folks where they are, and we're able to capture a lot of um, a lot of usage. A lot of users found value in using that product, and so um, I, I'm happy to share more about the Bcash program. But that's one that we find to be really successful. That's great. Thank you so much. It's a it's a great way to end. I know we're a few minutes over, so thank you to everyone who is joining us today in the conversation. Really, again, a thank you to NCRC for hosting us and having us on the panel. Um, we will be sending out uh, all the contact information for folks here. So please feel free to, free to reach out and, um, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.